Okay, well, if you have a copy of God's Word, get to Ephesians 6. We'll be in Ephesians 6.15 here in just a few minutes. And uh, as you're getting there, uh, let's uh, learn a little bit more about spiritual warfare and uh, what God's Word has to say about that. Uh, It was November the 27th, 1950, and the Chinese forces had surrounded the Allied forces in northern Korea in a particular battle in the Korean War called the Battle of Chosen, Re- Re- the Battle of Chosen Reservoir. There were 120 Chinese troops surrounding these mountainous, just unbelievable terrain, and there were the Allied forces that were down in the valley at the lake called Chosen, and it was pretty brutal, guys. Uh, If you could imagine bullets flying from every direction, you were completely outnumbered. You felt like retreat was the only option and survival was minimal. Like that's probably not going to happen. And not only were you surrounded by an enemy that was just charged with an all out assault to kill you, but also you were enduring brutal. Everybody say brutal, brutal conditions. Brutal conditions. Guys, if you can give me a little house lights, that'd be great. Brutal conditions. The, uh, the weather was roughly around average of negative 36 degrees Fahrenheit, maybe even as low as negative 38 degrees Fahrenheit. Everybody say, burr. <laughs> Man, that is chilly. That is some cold weather. The, the variables were so intense that the tundra below you was freezing, the air was freezing. I mean, literally, survival was, can we be honest, Optional. It was just, it was optional. And with the enemy encroaching on you, you don't know what you're going to do. Well, it was in this particular battle that Chester Puller was uh, the most decorated United States Marine commander in U.S. history. He said a very, very famous thing, uh, two particular statements. Uh, Number one, he said, we are surrounded. Good. That simplifies the problem. That's a really good, that's good news. If you think about it in the context of spiritual warfare, friends, that's great news because if you know where the enemy is, like, why are you upset about that? Like, you see, you know where he's coming. I'm good. I know. I know how to fight now because if the, if the artillery of the enemy is hitting me, I know we're in battle. I don't have to guess where it's coming from. The second thing that uh, this commander gave is really where the phrase, no retreat, came from that the Marines have held on to for so long. And he said these words, we're not retreating, we're attacking in a different direction. We're not retreating, we're just going to attack in a different direction. So this battle rages on 17 days. It's actually relatively short. And uh, with all of these ridiculous conditions going on, finally these allied troops figure out like a, let's call it a, a weak spot in the Chinese military, and they find a way, like a little pathway out to get a vantage point, and actually they take out, some say a quarter, some say as much as a third of those 120,000 troops in this particular battle, and they basically were able to go off into safety. Technically, when you look at the wars and the records for the wars uh, in the United States, like win-loss column, technically the chosen battle was a loss. Uh, But there was great, great learnings from this that actually led to further future victories. You see, they learned something from this particular battle, even in the loss. They learned something about the soldiers' equipment. Some great learnings. These soldiers are issued six pairs of socks and a particular style of shoes called shoe packs. P-A-C. They were issued shoe packs. Now, these particular boots were leather in the outsole, and then the insole was a rubber insole. Now, this sounds almost unbelievable, but you just have to take my word for it and go watch the documentary on your own. You can see it. So, this rubber insole and the leather outsole created something fascinating in sub-zero temperatures. It created a microwave on the foot. The foot began to perspire and sweat, and then as soon as that perspiration hit the air, the negative 38 degrees turned that sweat immediately into blocks of ice in their foot, and soldiers had frostbite in their boots. The men who survived that particular battle are infamously called the chosen frozen for that very reason. Now, what the military learned was they assessed, they pulled back and they said, hold on, 
well, this was a loss, but what's actually, what, what are we learning here in this moment? And so they come back and they pull and they go, we understand that in order to maintain success in battle, to have victory in battle, you got to have good shoes on your feet. You got to have some good shoes on your feet in order to stay alive and to thrive and to push back the actual enemy that's coming to kill you and to take you out. So this led to what we now know as the Mickey Mouse boot. Now, not the character, but go research it. And that particular boot in the military fashion, if you could say it that way, it is the literal newest technology that our military invented that is the baseline for all military footwear across the globe. And it changed the game for soldiers forever. You see, what the military knew was that a good pair of shoes will actually aid you and aid me in battle. The sermon in a sentence, or the big idea, if you will, is that you and I, we have, in order for us to stand, in order for us to stand strong, there are certain shoes that I have to put on. If you want to stand strong in battle, there is a particular kind of shoes that you and I have to put on in that battle in order to stand strong, to maintain our position, and then actually, truth be told, is to advance into enemy territory. There are certain shoes that we actually have to put on. The Apostle Paul has been telling us how to fight spiritual warfare, how to do this. He, uh, let's get a running start at this new piece of equipment. We're going to start in verse 14, and he said these words, stand. Everybody say stand. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. The Apostle Paul has given us two pieces of equipment to engage in spiritual battle. He's given us a belt of truth. The scripture tells us in other translations to gird our loins. The truth uh, that we put around us will stabilize us when the world is unstable. You see, if you and I uh, base our lives off of the subjective feelings that we're having in one particular moment, we'll waffle, we'll bend, we'll break, we'll fall. But if you and I place our faith and our trust in the, subje the objective truth of God's word and what it says, it stabilizes, has a stabilizing effect for our lives when the enemy comes and attacks. Then Paul says, add to that. That 70, uh, not 70, the total armor is 70 pounds. And the bulk of the weight of that armor is found in the chest. Now, if you could imagine that uh, Roman soldier holding that breastplate, they're, they're crippled over their shoulders because that weight is weighing it down. Unless they have the belt of truth on them. And that belt of truth stabilizes and helps disperse the weight of that uh, breastplate of righteousness and allows them to stand strong because the belt supports the breastplate. And the breastplate of righteousness is simply you and me living in right alignment with the truth of God's word. And that creates the environment that invites God's blessing, God's favor, and God's uh, victory in our lives spiritually. Then... Paul adds this third piece of equipment for us. He says in verse 15, he puts these words together and says, And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Can I just say, finally, finally, something we can all relate to. I never owned a breastplate. I've never, I mean, I got a belt, but I mean, I don't think about belt as something that's awesome. I mean, maybe you like belts. I don't really, I mean, belts are neutral to me, but I do like shoes. Shoes are awesome and shoes make sense, right? Shoes make sense in engaging in battle because you don't go into battle barefoot. If you go into battle barefoot, you're losing. You're losing that battle. So he gives us shoes, a particular kind of shoes, that's actually really important. So I started thinking about shoes and the functionality of shoes. And uh, we all have shoes. I, I got some shoes here. And let's just talk about what these shoes are good for. Um, and uh, let's have a little bit of fun. We, I don't have anything else better to do, so let's just do this. So uh, what are these? R tennis shoes, running shoes, what are they used for? Running, excellent, yep. Uh, and uh, somebody said last hour, running at night, that would be true. 
Uh, but uh, um, so these shoes uh, are also, man, if you're going to go to King's Island, you're going to go to a theme park, you're not going to necessarily run, uh, but you're going to want some comfort on your feet that provide comfort for a long period of time. Um, and so that's what those do. Um, let's see here. I got some more. Um, here's another pair of shoes. Um, wh- what are these? Jordans, correct. Uh, they're basketball shoes. Uh, Danny only wears these on Easter every other year. Um, and he doesn't wear them outside. He only wears them inside. So kind of defeats the purpose. You could lick the bottom of the shoe. It's how clean they are. Uh, but uh, these, yeah, originally those are basketball shoes. Jordan was killing it in these originally. Um, but now they're fashion shoes. Speaking of that, um, we've got some uh, custom Air Force Ones by Grant, uh, one of our students, and he hand-painted these, by the way. Uh, these are insane. Um, I think they're called the Tiffany Leopard. Uh, so it's, yeah, isn't that cool? That's great. Uh, but uh, you just have these because they're cool. Uh, let's see here. Oh, what do these shoes communicate? Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, you ain't getting off the couch when you got these things on. Uh, so uh, comfort, chillaxing. Some of you, it's a bag of potato chips. Others of you, it's ice cream, uh, whatever. Uh, what about, now, I didn't get these out of my closet. I know it's 2021, and it could have happened that way, but I didn't get these out of my closet. Uh, so uh, what, what do these shoes communicate? Dress, boardroom is what I thought. Man, somebody's killing it. That somebody's my wife, uh, and so she's killing it in these. Got a little stud in the background. Never noticed that, uh, but... Uh, uh, here's another one. Uh, what are these? They're cycling shoes. Yeah, so uh, if I put these bad boys on, I'd be walking like this. You know, I mean, uh, they're ineffective. Uh, and in, uh, they're ineffective unless you're on a bike. And then you lock in, and you're clipped in. And then if you can't get your shoes off the pedals, you take your feet out of the shoes and you, not that this is a testimony or anything, and then you just roll off onto the ground and try to figure that out. (laughs) These things are good for one thing and one thing only, cycling. Now, what's really cool is the designers put a little, like, vent right here. So if you got, like, I don't know, janky, smelly feet, they got a little air conditioner a little right there. You just, right in there. It's pretty awesome. Oh, it's got a little exit, too, there, you know, entrance exit right there. Didn't even know that. Okay, uh, here, what about these? Now, this is from my world. Not, I'm not this person, but uh, I, I have been before. Uh, what are these? Cowboy boots. Yeah, now, some of you want to wear these because you want to be taller. That's fine. Some of you want to wear them because you're going to go do the boot scoot and boogie. You're going to two-step. Do they even have those clubs around here, like, like two-step clubs? So you don't even know what a two-step is, so forget it. We're moving on. Let me tell you what this is. Um, uh, the, the cowboy boots are not just for style. They're actually functional, super functional. Like, like, listen, if you go ride a horse, nobody's rocking vans. Like, you're not rocking vans wearing a horse. No, these have a specific design to them. Actually, this is a, uh, I, I think these are called, this part's called the shaft, I think is what it is. But this part of the boot is a shorter part of the boot. But typically, like traditional cowboy boots are longer, uh, and they protect the leg from when you're riding in brush from snakes or other animals to protect your legs so they don't get injured. But also, fun fact, you've got a little thing right here that kicks your foot into the stirrup so that you can have support because vans are just a slide, but this right there catches on the stirrup so you're stable and you're supported. Pretty awesome design. Again, it's great for, you know, whatever, but it's great for cowboy night or whatever you're doing in your fraternity, whatever. Okay, last pair. Last pair. These are not mine as well because my foot is not this size. What are these? Cleat, what are these used for? Sports, okay, but what else? What? Grip, stability. This, the, these shoes would allow you and allow me to cut, to make quick moves. Uh, if it's raining like this and, you know, Kale, my, these are my Kale, my daughters. If she's out playing soccer in the rain, uh, then what these shoes allow you to do is to stand and then uh, be able to make quick moves so that you don't slip and fall on your backside and you get smoked and you get beat. Uh, that's not... Yeah, you go play soccer in these. You, you, uh, no, it's not going to work. Uh, you can't play soccer in these either. Uh, you may be some other ones, but the best shoe for the function 
of sports and soccer is a cleat. Now, by the way, when my kids were little, they couldn't say cleat for some reason. They called them cleats. So cleats is what they are. And this is exactly what the Apostle Paul had in mind when he told us, as for shoes of your feet, the shoes that are armor that God gives you to endure battle with your spiritual enemy is a cleat. It's something that gives you grip. It's something that gives you stability, something that allows you to feel confident. Even when the ground isn't confident, you're allowed to stand there knowing I'm supported. I'm good. I'm fine. I can endure this for a moment. The word that he uses for shoes in the Greek is kalaga, C-A-L-I-G-A. The Roman kalaga looks like this. Uh, it's a version of a cleat uh, that they would have in the first and maybe second century. And there were these little metal studs that were at the bottom of these shoes. And it allowed them uh, to, get, ma- to maintain their stability and their footing when they're in battle on the battleground against their enemy. Interestingly enough, this denotes something important. Real battle is hand-to-hand combat. Yeah, in spiritual battle, it's not, you don't have a drone that's doing it from a distance. You don't have snipers. Uh, Spiritual battle is done in hand-to-hand combat. And you and I have to have spiritual shoes strapped to our feet that God gives us that allows us to grip where we are in the moment, if I could say it this way, get a grip in the moment and stand strong and stand confident as our enemy is coming right at us. He's given us shoes. He's given us shoes. Everybody say shoes. You got certain shoes that you're supposed to put on. Verse 15 continues. Verse 15 continues and he says, as for shoes for your feet, we just broke down what shoes is. Now we're jumping over here, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Uh, The New American Standard Bible says it a little differently, but I think it gives a better idea of what Paul's trying to say. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, that's an old school word. Nobody, I've never met anybody that's talked to me like that before. Sup, shod? Now, maybe shot A, but not shod. <laughs> no, shotting is not a word that people use. Nobody uses that unless you're a part of one particular industry. Horses. Horses. Now, there's a huge debate in the horse world to shot or not to shot. Is that right? Yeah. So uh, to shot or not to shot. She knows a lot about horses over here. And do we go barefoot or do we put these horseshoes on this particular horse? Now. I didn't come here to exegete horse culture, but I did come here to tell you about shotting. It's the idea of taking a horseshoe, flipping over that hoof on the horse, and essentially, bear with me here, semi-permanently attaching a horseshoe to protect the hoof, to provide stability uh, for the horse, to put a shoe on its foot for essentially semi-permanent time. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul is communicating when he says having shod or having put on the readiness of these shoes. It's the idea of shodding your feet, attaching to your feet with permanence these particular shoes that God's going to give you. In other words, friends, what this means is it means ain't nobody else putting those shoes on your feet but you. You have to do it. You have to consciously make the decision to put the shoes of the gospel of peace on your feet. Your mom's not doing it. Your dad's not doing it. Your spouse isn't doing it. Your grandpappy's not doing it. Your grandma's not doing it. Your preacher's not doing it. Your best friend's not doing it. Your aunt or uncle is not going to do it. Some professor's not going to do it. You've got to do it. You are the one that has to put these particular shoes on. You have to put forth the effort, and you're the one who's going to stand in them. They can't stand in your shoes anyway. You have to stand in the shoes that God gives you. And when you put these on, it communicates the idea, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm, for, I'm ready for what, whatever comes my way. I'm ready for whatever arrow that we'll study in a few weeks. I'm ready for every dart. I'm ready for every attack. I'm ready for every strategy and scheme and anything the enemy's going to come at me with. These shoes on my feet, I'm ready for whatever the enemy is about to throw at me. I'm paying attention. I'm not losing my mind. I'm engaged in what's actually happening in this particular moment. They're powerful. 
They're powerful. When you strap on these shoes, friends, you're strapping on power. When you're strapping on these gospel shoes of peace, you're strapping on insane amounts of power. Insane amounts of power. As a matter of fact, R. Kent Hughes, one of my favorite commentators, says it like this. The readiness of our text pictures us being ready with our caliga, caliga, uh, firmly planted on the solid ground. Thus, because you're firmly planted, established. The enemy is not going to be able to push back. Rather, he, we are ready to set, uh, set to advance. So you're not just in a defensive position, ready to see what's going to happen. You're actually now in an offensive position. If you guys, uh, I don't know if you're any basketball fans, but when you teach a little kid to play basketball, there's a particular stance that you teach a kid when they catch a ball. Does anybody know what that stance is called? Triple threat. Triple threat is this. What can you do in the triple threat position? You can pivot. You can dribble. You can pass. I would say pivot is not necessarily one of them, but dribble, pass, or shoot. you got three options. It's a triple threat. So it's not defensive, is it? It's actually offensive. So when you stand with the readiness of the gospel of peace on your feet, you're in a triple threat position. You have an opportunity right now to not fall on your backside because you're ready, you're stout, your legs are ready to go, and you're ready to take action. You're ready to move forward. You're ready to progress and take enemy ground. So many of us right now, spiritually, we're not in the triple threat position. We're in the no threat position because you ain't got any shoes on and you're standing there with your arms crossed or your hands in your pockets and the enemy, all he has to do is go, boop. That's it. Boop. That's one, one little touch because you're not in an aggressive stance, ready, standing firm on the gospel of peace. When you strap those gospel of peace shoes on your feet, you're ready to advance and to take ground. I love Love what the Apostle Paul says. Listen, i got to tell you guys this. I'm preaching better than you're listening, so you better get on the same page. (laughs) Come on, it's the last week of two services. Get on the ball here. Here we go. I love what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians. In Philippians 3, he talks about this advancing, this powerful advancing in your spiritual life and taking ground. He says, forgetting what lies behind. How many of us know that everything that lies behind us is where the enemy loves to live. He camps out in what lies behind. He camps out over here and he reminds you of, oh, you remember yesterday. Oh, you remember last year. Oh, you remember, you know, what you used to. And then you live in the shoulda, coulda, woulda season of your life. And he is an expert at reminding us of what lies behind And I just want to tell you that your God is not a God that lies behind. Your God is a God who is an ever-present God and a present help in a time of need now. And he is a future God. You look back at God's past faithfulness as a moment to remind you in the moment that in the season of struggle, I will let my faith be built. I will endure. I will be, I will persevere. I will stand in faith because you're learning from the past, but you're not living in the past. Christians don't live in the past. Some of us are living in the past so much right now. And you go, well, let's go, let's go sit on some dude's couch or some lady's couch and unearth every single thing that's ever happened to us when we were a kid. Awesome. You go do that. Let me save you 300 bucks. Forget what lies behind. Forget what lies behind. And what does he say? Straining forward. Straining forward to what lies ahead. The best, listen, have you ever seen, this is what a lot of us are doing as Christians. Get ready because I might fall off the stage. You're, you're running, looking back. Or, I mean, like we're supposed to be going this way, and we're looking back this way, and we're, all t- we're, all, we're directionless. We're directionless, and we're wondering why we don't live in victory and why we're not living in victory. And really, Satan's like, I love this. This is great. This is my favorite Friday night event is to watch Christians run this way, but they're looking that way and living in their past. He says, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. He says, I press on. Everybody say, press on. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying, listen, Christians, 
you need to strap on the right shoes. Get your body in the right position. And you don't, listen, you get your shoulders square and you get your hips square. You get your feet positioned firm on the gospel of peace. And you are chasing, you are pursuing, you are running, you are engaging the author and the perfecter of our faith, Hebrews says. And you are looking to him. And when you look to him, you'll easily look back at your life and go, yep, I stunk that up, but praise God for his grace. And I'm glad that the gospel changes people because it's changed me. And you will begin to live in victory. The reason we're living in defeat is because you live back here. You're living back here. Don't live back there. Don't, and then when you have a family member or you have a friend that's dragging you back, full permission to Holy Spirit beat down. Say, knock it off. What are you, you're not, I'm not going to let you be a tool of the enemy in my life. You want to go have that party, party of one, go. I'm not involved with that. I'm not involved with that because I'm straining forward. I'm pressing on. I'm pressing on, y'all. I'm so sick of that. Who's sick of that? Let, I'm pressing on. Let's press on. And when you, amen, come on. I love it. Pressing on. Pressing on. Do you have your shoes on? I hope you do. He goes on and he says, and as for shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness of the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace. What is the gospel of peace? It's interesting, actually, as you begin to study your Bible more and more and you look at the Apostle Paul's writings, you'll quickly find Paul likes to write about peace and loves writing about the gospel, but he's never written about the gospel of peace except for here. What does this mean? It actually throws people like the theological curveball. It's like, what is that? What is he, what is he trying to say? What is the gospel of peace? Well, Here's what people have done with this. Is basically what has happened is we communicate this idea. Oh, man, because they love this. And they immediately run to Romans 10. Romans 10 is simply a quotation of Isaiah 52. And it says this. And how are they to preach unless they are sent? That is a question that we already know the answer. You can't preach if you don't go. Okay, so there's a goingness to the preaching. Okay, cool. And then it quotes the Isaiah 52, 7. As it is written... How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. I'm fully convinced that this is sanctified pedicure right here in the text. Some of y'all need to go get your toes cut on. I'm just telling you right now. So here it is. How We all want beautiful feet. And so what he's saying is, is hey, you got good looking feet if you're moving. You gotta be, now, you got to understand, their feet in the first century were some janky crow busters because they didn't have leather shoes. They had all, they didn't have fingernail clippers they didn't go get pedicures and manicures it was nasty y'all nasty think toe fungal times a million it's nasty sorry i just puked in my mouth just a little bit sorry uh it was very very gross and but and so this idea of beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel and so what what we've done and people who try to interpret what Paul is saying is, oh, man, here it is. This is how you bring in the gospel shoes of peace. You strap on your gospel shoes and you get to preaching. And as you begin to preach the gospel out there in the world, you begin to bring peace. I have a problem with that. Specifically, just the text in, X, in Ephesians. I agree that this is a preaching verse. Romans 10 is a preaching verse of, hey, go preach, and it will bring peace. Now, a lot of us are like, no, uh -uh, no, no. I've started to share the gospel at Kroger once, and I literally wanted to die. Y you know, and so that was the last thing I thought of was peace. I, I understand what you're saying, and I get that. The enemy just wants you to feel weird, like you got two left feet. You don't have to feel weird. He's convinced you that it's awkward, and that's, oh, man, i got to earn the right with everybody, and i got to be friends, and i got to, no, they don't. You don't have to do that. I never saw Jesus walk into, uh, you know, one of his great sermons. It's like, hey, hey, bro, come here, come here. Paul didn't do that. There wasn't a lot of this. Now, I'm not saying that they weren't nice. Paul says practice hospitality. You should. But obviously, Jesus just kind of declared. He declared. He was the walking embodiment of truth. And so his life was preaching truth, and he brought truth wherever he went. I think we should be doing the same thing, too, and not feel weird when we begin to talk about Jesus. 
So, anyway, this is a preaching verse. But Ephesians 6.15 is not a preaching verse. This is not strapping on your preaching shoes and then go preaching, and then that brings in the peace of God. Now, that is true. Just find that verse and preach that verse. Preach that verse from that text. That's a major problem in churches today is we like to hijack verses, cherry pick verses that we love, and then preach that text. Don't do that. Don't hijack God's verse. Don't hijack God's Bible. Treat it wholly and reverently as it is. And so if we want those verses, go there. Ephesians 6 is not that verse. Ephesians 6, here's a Bible word. The study of Scripture, how to interpret Scripture and know it, is called hermeneutics. And as you study the Word of God, you learn some laws, laws of interpretation. One key way to understanding what a particular verse is, word is, phrase is, is to understand this concept, that the context of the verse helps you determine the meaning of that verse. So you don't just get to go, oh, I like there. That I'll apply that to my life. Well, that's not how this works. Your every single sentence has a point. Every single group of sentences, which is called a paragraph, has a particular point. Every book of the Bible has a big theme. And then every single, you got New Testament has a theme. And then the Old Testament has a theme. And then it all has an overarching theme that all connects together. It all works together. It's not some just rando thing that just happens. And so what's the context of the gospel shoes of peace? Well, Paul tells us, what's the goal of spiritual warfare? Stand, verse 11. Verse 13 says to stand or to withstand. Verse 14 says to withstand. The whole context of spiritual warfare is standing. So these shoes have less to do with going and preaching. It has everything to do with standing firm on something. So then let's break it down. What is the something? The something is the gospel of peace. So let's start this. What is the gospel? Great question to write down. What is the gospel? Now, we live in a day where Christians are hijacking this particular word and calling things gospel that aren't gospel. Bro, that's so gospel. So gospel. I don't have anything else better to do, so... Let me just say this. We've turned masks into gospel. Oh, that's so gospel. Has nothing to do with the actual gospel. Vaccine. Oh, that's so gospel. No. Now, those might be safe. Those might be smart. But they're not gospel. So we're confused on what gospel is. Well, what's gospel? Man, that's gospel, man. It's like eating a cheeseburger at lunch and going, that's gospel. Why don't you just say, bro, that's awesome, or bro, that's good. That's the actual right way to describe that, but we've hijacked gospel. What is gospel? Gospel is the Greek word evangelion, which means good news. Everybody say good news. It's good news. So maybe that burger is gospel then, right? I mean, if it's 130, I mean, maybe, no, it's not. It's specific good news. It's a specific kind of of good news. Oh, well, let's start with this. Why is it good news? Here's why it's actually good news. Because you and me have a problem. And the problem is, is that we are at war with God. You and I, we are at odds with our creator, God. We are on the opposite side of the street of God because of a little three-letter word called sin. You were born into that. You didn't do anything but inherit that nature from your great-grandpappy called Adam. You inherited that nature just like I did, and we, our soul is at war with God. We are separated from God because he is holy and can't tolerate sin. So there is a massive chasm between you and God and me and God, and our souls are at war with him. That is the bad news, friend. And Paul beautifully puts it out in Romans chapter 5, and he says these great words in Romans 5, verse 6. For while we were still weak... At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Friends, that's you and me. Like that ungodly, that, that, that is all of us. I know it's hard for us to imagine all these children. I'm not trying to hate. All these parents are going to leave our church now. But uh, all these parents that dedicated our kids. But our kids are lumped into that. 
because they haven't had professed faith in Christ yet. Now, they have some thumbprint of God on their life, like that joy and innocence that comes with being a little baby. But as they grow, you begin to see, wow, sin nature. Nobody taught that selfishness. Nobody taught that destructive behavior. Nobody taught that little kid how to back talk me. They learn that on their own. How do they do that? Because they have a sin nature. They have a sin nature. And so God says that that's us. Now, he skips down to verse 8 and says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, while you were still separate, if God is here, perfect, holy, just, and righteous, and here we are over here, not perfect, not holy, and not righteous, and sin is what separates us between us and God, God is over there. He's looking over here at you and at me in the state of sin that we are in, and we are enjoying it, friends. We're loving it. We're sinning like it's going out of style. It is awesome. It's like serve me more of that because it's super, super fun. And I enjoy that. And it's fun for about a second. And then you feel shame. Then you feel regret. Then you feel guilt, right? Don't leave me up here by myself, right? Yes, that's how it is. And so, but what God does is God shows his love. Isn't that fascinating? That God shows his love for us when he's over there in righteous, holy, and blameless land, separated by sin, and sees you and me in all of the sin that we are in. And he says, I'm motivated by my love for them to save them. And what I love about this is that God doesn't look through the corridors of time and he sees you out here in some future version of yourself where you got everything together. You've got every sin under wraps. You've got everything under control. You no longer have an anger issue. You no longer have this part of your personality that you wish you didn't have. You no longer say these things. You no longer hang out with those people like you are over here living in victorious land. God isn't motivated by a better future version of you. He's motivated by this version of you over here that while you're still sinning his love is coming to you through his son jesus christ to die for you to bridge that gap of sin and get you to a right relationship with god bro that's gospel that's gospel do you see why everything else can't be gospel like the other thing, like other other things can't be gospel they're anti-gospel They're anti-Christ, little a. They're not gospel. So if we begin to make everything else a gospel issue that God never said is a gospel issue, what's a gospel issue? Sin. (laughs) Sin is a gospel issue, and God's outrageous love to rescue you from that sin is gospel. Since, verse 9, therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. You didn't do anything to get yourself right with God. God did that through his son, Jesus. He goes on and says in verse 10, for while we were still, we were enemies. That's not fun to say anymore. Nobody's writing that book, Enemy of God. Maybe I will. But nobody's writing that. They're not getting a book deal. Nobody's calling anybody to a conference or got a, you know, a million follower channel on YouTube. It's like, hey, my Bible study week number one is you're an enemy of God. See you next week. But the facts are true because of sin. That's where it is. But check this. But we are reconciled to God by God. Uh, We are reconciled to God uh, uh, by the death of his son. Much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have now received reconciliation. Bill has been paid. Everything balances out. You are now victorious because of Christ, not because of you. And he, as a good dad, looked at you and said, look at the way of Christ. Look at how he is. Look at his perfect life. And he begins to turn your heart. He begins to open your heart to the things of God. And you begin to see that. You begin to see that path. You begin to learn that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And you look at that and you go, yeah, there's no way I can get over there. Only God can get me there. And you express your faith and trust in Jesus to step across that bridge, cross the great divide of sin, and enter into a relationship with Jesus. That's the good news. Now, guess what happens to you and me when that happens? You get to embrace Paul's thesis. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, all the way at the beginning, he says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. We have peace with God. Friends, if you want to put on the peace of God, you have to embrace Christ by faith. You have to believe 
the gospel. you got to stand on the gospel. you got to stand on the fact that you're a sinner in need of a Savior and Jesus is the only Savior. And you strap that on your feet and you'll stand victorious in battle. The war is won, Christ is ours, and we are his. You don't have to perform anymore, there's no more wondering. Uh, His peace is now our peace. And that is unshakable ground when the enemy begins to attack. It's unshakable ground when you're standing there and your life is firmly standing on on, on, on the fact that Jesus Christ is the one that initiated this thing. Jesus Christ is the one that's loving me. Jesus Christ is the one that is saving me. Jesus Christ is the one that is empowering me. Jesus Christ is the one who is strengthening me. Jesus Christ is the one who will come for me. And so he will be the one that rescues me. And so if I'm standing on anything else, you're going to fall. But if you're standing on the gospel, you're standing on the firmest and surest foundation when the enemy attacks you. And you now have confidence. You got a little, dare I say, spiritual swagger. You got a little bit of confidence to where you're like, Satan, I don't really care what you're coming at me with today because I know that I have certain shoes on. I have certain shoes that I am anchored in Christ and that he is mine and that I am his and that he will strengthen me in this battle. I have certain shoes on. Well, what does that look like? We see a great picture of this in John 18 from the life of Peter. It's the night that Jesus Christ would be betrayed. Just get into your mind with me for a second. It was cold and it was dark. Jesus was sweating drops of blood and trying to come and interject these two, these three disciples, Peter, James, and John over here. Can you please stay awake and pray with me? I need that support. I need that love. I need that lifting because I need to be lifted right now. As he walks off, somebody says, what's up with Jesus? What's weighing him down? What's going on? Before they can even get the words out, their eyes are already starting to be heavy again. And really what felt like maybe minutes was seconds. And barreling through the gate of the Garden of Gethsemane is an army of ferocious religious leaders and temple priests and temple guards under the lit of the torches coming to arrest Christ. And in the front of the line, who's with them? Judas. In the moment, Peter, James, and John step up. Jesus stepped up and he's seeing this happen. You got to imagine, put your sanctified imagination on for just a second. Peter's like, I knew that guy was a scumbag. I knew that he wasn't with us. I knew he was a punk. Jesus, let me take him out. Before anything else happens, Jesus steps up and he says, who are you looking for? Who have you come for? And they answer him, we're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene. Jesus takes a deep breath and he says, Three powerful words. I am he. And that moment, all the oxygen in the garden evaporates, and these men fall onto the dirt, belly first. They are under the full weight of Jesus' actual name. This would have immediately gone to those religious leaders into their brains, trailed them back into a Bible study, back into Exodus chapter 3, where Moses and this burning bush thing happens, and God speaks to him through a bush, tells him to go deliver the nation of Israel from Egypt, and Moses says, I'll go, but you got to tell me who's sending me. I can't tell him this burning bush from Bezak showed up and told me where in the world I'm getting, who's taking, I, I don't know what to do. Who's sending me? Tell him I am that I am sent you. I am the God who have always has been. I am the God who currently is and the God who always will be. Jesus says, when he says, I am he, immediately in their brains, it goes back to that moment and it's God just showed up in the garden. God is the one who is here. You're looking not just for Jesus the Christ, you are looking for God. And you have been waiting for me for this entire time and they all fall to the ground under the full weight of the glory of God. And Peter looks at this and says, Oh my gosh, you have got to be kidding me. You imagine the kind of strength Peter felt in that moment. Yeah, that's right. Stay down there. If anybody was going to think that, it would have been Peter. Where does all that confidence come from for Peter? What he does next is absolutely insane. Apparently, one of those guys drops a sword. Peter's like, yeah, Jesus, you got them. I got this too. And he goes and whacks off Malchus's ear. Where in the world does Peter get this kind of confidence to come at a charging enemy in a vulnerable moment? You get the picture? 
vulnerable moment, how does he get the confidence to push back into the enemy territory and make an aggressive move? Where does that confidence come from? It comes from the very presence of Jesus in the garden when the enemy attacks right there with him. The enemy's coming. Jesus is here and he's like, dude, if the very words of Jesus can make these men fall to the ground, surely if I go charging, they come after me and they start coming after me. Jesus will get them. I'll just cry out and Jesus will be like, and something will happen. I don't know what will happen, but something will happen. And he's able to go into battle with confidence because Christ is with them. Friends, I want to tell you some really good news. Some really, really good news is that when you're in spiritual battle, you don't have Jesus next to you. Some of us would be like, man, I just wish I had Jesus physically right here with me, right here and right now. I'll do you one better. When Jesus ascended into heaven, do you know what the Bible says? Jesus said it is necessary for me to go into heaven. It is better for me to go to heaven. Why? Because I'm going to send you a comforter, a, the Greek word is paraclete, one who comes alongside of you and who now is in you and you will have the presence of the Holy Spirit in you and it is better to have me in you than it is to have me with you and when you're in battle you don't have Jesus as your dude off to the side Jesus is your leader commander in chief of your soul fighting the battle for you now so you can stand in confidence you absolutely can have confidence that's the gospel shoes that's what you're strapping on your feet is like Jesus is with me Jesus is fighting this battle. Jesus is standing with me. Jesus is going to make me endure. Jesus is the one who is going to give me the wisdom to lean in, the wisdom to fall back, the wisdom to move to the right, the wisdom to move to the left, when to engage, when not to engage. He's going to make me nimble. He's going to make me quick. And it's his strength in me that allows me to stand confidently on him as he is in me. John said it later. He said it in 1 John. He came at it and said, you better be able to test the spirit. You better be able to make sure that what's coming at you, you know what it is. And the only way you're going to be able to know what it is is if you're girded with truth, you got the righteousness on you, and the gospel is standing you up. You better be able to test the spirits of what evil spirit is coming at you. And then he says this. I like this. Verse 4, little children. Feels like a little dig, to be honest with you. All right, boys. Hush it up. Listen to me. You are from God. That's your identity, friends. Now, if you're not a Christian today, it is all about struggle. It is all about you not being able to overcome. It is all about you fighting and fighting and fighting, going to the self-help section at Barnes & Noble, finding the number one bestseller on Amazon, and you're going after it. You're looking at every blog post, how to overcome whatever, and it ain't going to happen without Christ. That is your story apart from Christ. Constant defeat, utter turmoil, and ultimately, I'm just telling you, be real with you because I love you, it's death. But you actually have an opportunity for life on the other side with Christ. As Christians, we are people, again, who press on and press forward in victory. We're, we're, we're not living from a place of trying to achieve victory. It's already ours. It's already ours. And so he says, you are from God. You're God's. And have overcome those things that are, guys, the things that are already coming at me, the things that are already coming at you that are like laser beam to your soul, you already have overcome them. In the spirit realm, God has already beaten them because of the cross and the resurrection. You just don't have access to that power yet because you're not living in the power of the spirit. So he says, you are from God and have overcome them. And he, oh my goodness, is in you. Greater than he who is in the world. Jesus, by the power of the Spirit, is in you. And if he is in you, there is no battle you can't win. There's no fight that you'll ever have to lose. And so many of us are losing because we're barefoot. We don't have the right shoes on. We're playing soccer with boots playing soccer with Peloton riding shoes. It's muddy. You need traction. You need the right shoes on. As for shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. 
the gospel of peace. Remember, Paul hasn't connected these two together, but he's written a lot about peace and a lot about the gospel. So he's got these shoes that he wants for us that are called gospel shoes of peace. Hmm. What do you think Paul meant when he said peace? Well, when you think of peace, what comes to your mind? When I think of peace, even now in our context today, you might think of things like no justice, no peace. Maybe when you think about peace, you immediately go to a very calm, quiet room where everybody else is calm and quiet and meditating or leaving their body or whatever they're doing in those yoga things. I'm struggling. I've tried yoga. I hate it. I'm not flexible, so I can't do it. Or maybe you're like me and Joy, 31 days and counting until we head south to the white sand beaches of the Gulf of Mexico, and that is what peace is. Come on. You know what's interesting, though? This is the only thing the world offers us as peace. Because the truth is, you live in a fallen world because of sin. And even though we all desperately desire justice, this side of heaven, it will gloriously fall short. And so there will be a lack of peace. Because there will be a lack of justice. Ultimately, the yoga class will end. The quiet room will then be traded in for your crazy lifestyle that is your home with your kids. Every vacation comes to an end. And that's all that the world has to offer us with peace. Even if you drink it, it don't feel good forever. Even if you smoke it, it doesn't last forever. Even if you pop the pill or shoot it in your arm or whatever it might be for you, you're an adrenaline junkie. It goes in for a second. It lasts for just a moment. And that is not real peace. It's fleeting peace. It's a high. That's all it is. So, what is peace then? If that's not peace, then what, what is peace? The story's told of a man who just loves art. And he called on two particular artists to paint a painting of embod the embodiment of what peace is. So he charges them, tells them he'll reward the one who embodies the picture of peace best on the canvas and then they come back first man shows up he shows his painting and everybody steps back and is just like wow that's peace and it was a serene picture of some coastal land with great beaches palm trees and it was beautiful everybody thought that's peace so then when they ushered in the next gentleman with his piece and his painting it was the antithesis of that particular painting it was more like chaos, less like peace, and it left everybody bewildered. <laughs> what in the world does, is this actually going, what is, what is going on? And this is what the picture looked like. The night sky, black and dark, is filled with lightning and the crack of thunder. You can almost hear the thunder in the painting. The wind is howling and whipping. The waves are crashing on the side of the rocks. The rocks are then tumbling. The rain is pelting all around you and all around this whole scene. And everybody looks at that and says, that's not peace, man. Like, that's ridiculousness. That's absolute chaos. Until a man locates the epicenter of peace. He comes down to the bottom part of the painting and finds a little bird nesting there in a calm, serene moment in the midst of all that pain and all that suffering and all of that storm. The bird just sits there perched in peace while all this around her is in chaos. The man steps back. His lip begins to quiver. Tears fall down his face and he says, that's it. That's what peace really is. That's actually what peace is. I mean, we all know that 
anybody can sing and clap and dance when the sun is shining and the sky is blue, the stimulus checks are rolling in, the bank account is full, and uh, your health is great, and your kids are obeying. It's green lights every way, every day to work. It is awesome. And anybody can say, I am at peace now because that is easy. But real peace is when the waves of worry come onto the shore of your family. Real peace is when doubt shows up in the dark moments of your life and you still trust in the Father. Real peace is when the pain of rain comes and touches every nerve of your family and your life and you still say, God, I trust you. God, you are faithful. God, you are still on your throne. God, this doesn't make sense, but your way are higher than my ways. Your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. And I default to your sovereign hand of control. And I, like the bird in the middle of the storm, will remain at peace because I'm firmly planted on the foundation of the gospel of peace. Tony Evans said it better than I could. I want to give this as a gift to you today. If you're not reading the book, Victory and Spiritual Warfare, it says this. Peace doesn't refer to the inner calm when all around you is calm. When you are surrounded by tranquility, you are supposed to be calm. When you are on the beach sipping your pina colada, you're supposed to feel relaxed. When you're at the spa getting a massage, you're supposed to feel relaxed. When you're sitting by your pool, you're supposed to be relaxed. All of that makes total sense. That's duh. But the Christian is the one who people look at and go, I don't understand that. I don't get that. Do you see what's happening in your life? Everything's crumbling. And yet you're still hopeful? What, why, why are you okay? When you experience godly peace, you are at rest even when everything else is all wrong. All wrong. When the world around you is caving in and collapsing and everything around you just doesn't work and you're like, God, what is going on with my health? God, what is going on at work? God, what is going on with my friendships? Like, I don't understand this. What's going on? I don't understand this thing right now, whatever the thing is for you. And the thing is, is Christians, what we do is we stand flat-footed on Jesus, and we stand on the gospel of peace with the girded, with the truth of the gospel around our waist, and stand with the righteousness of Christ, and we are confident, and we are moving forward, and when we have the right shoes on, it doesn't matter what the battleground looks like. When you've got the right shoes on, it doesn't matter what blows into your life. When you've got the right shoes on, it doesn't matter what she says, he says, or they say. When you've got the right shoes on, you can be at peace no matter what. Remember, our big idea for today is in order to stand strong, there are certain shoes that I have to put on. Certain that I am who I am in Christ. Certain that when the waves come, the winds come, and they crash, I will be at peace. It is well with my soul no matter what. And when that happens, Paul says, you get a peace. You get the peace of God. That surpasses all understanding. If I were to give you just one thing to kind of think about this week, it's this. Paul said in Colossians, let the peace of Christ rule. Let it rule in your hearts. Let it help you dictate your decisions. Let it get your emotions back in check with the truth of God's word. Let it rule. Let it dominate. Let it be the enforcer. Let it be the enforcer that it is. Let it be the stabilizer that it can bring. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Father, we...